Our scripture reading this morning is from James chapter 2, and I will be reading verses 14 through 26, where James, the apostle and the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, half-brother, wrote, What good is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. I just have to stop for a moment there and comment. There's only one place in scripture um, where the words faith alone appear together in a single text, and this is it. Um, But I'm not denying sola fide. Um, We are saved by faith and not by works. But we also have to deal with the text honestly and accurately. So we have to address this in the context of James chapter 2. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. Please be seated. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word this morning, we pray that you would send your spirit to guide us into the truth, that we may hear, that we may receive, that we may understand, and above all, Father, that we we may put into practice and be obedient to the word that you send us this morning. Speak to us and give us ears to hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last Sunday, we were talking about the royal law which is an expression that is used by James, and he made it clear in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, and here it is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, in other words, if you fail to fulfill the command to love your neighbor as yourself by showing partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So it's a pretty simple formula here, really, if you fulfill the law, if you are a doer of the word, which is how James framed that a little bit earlier in this book. If you are a doer of the word, you are doing well. But if not, if you are just one who hears and does not put into practice the word, you deceive yourself and you are committing sin. It makes perfect sense. But we might still be tempted to ask the question, if we are saved by faith alone, and we certainly are, and not by works, which we clearly are not, then what difference does it make? Why does James write to people, at least many of whom would have been Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, people who trusted in the Lord and were seeking to follow him and were forgiven wholly by grace because of their faith in Christ Jesus? Why does he write to them and tell them, if you fulfill the law, you do well, but if you don't fulfill the law, if you show partiality, If you commit this sin, you are convicted by the law as transgressors. And it's a question that has been around in Christendom for a very long time. But if, as the Apostle Paul once wrote, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, why should we be concerned about being convicted by the law as transgressors? 
As I said, it's a question that's been around for a very long time. Paul himself asked something similar in Romans chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. He said, but if through my lie, through my sin, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? Don't we have to sin in order to experience the grace of God? Isn't that how it works? Why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying? And even our own Heidelberg Catechism asks on Lord's Day 32, since we have been delivered from our misery by God's grace alone through Christ, and not because we have earned it, why then must we still do good? A little bit more recently, back in about 100 years ago, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the Lutheran pastor and theologian, wrestled with this question in his classic work, The Cost of Discipleship. He wrote Cheap Grace, and if you sense that that's kind of a pejorative expression, it is. Cheap Grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. The world goes on in the same old way, and we are still sinners, even in the best life, as Luther said. Well then, let the Christian live like the rest of the world. Let him model himself on the world standards in every sphere of life, and not presumptuously aspire to live a different life under grace from his old life under sin. Bonhoeffer goes on, the world has been justified by grace. The Christian knows that and takes it seriously. He knows that he must not strive against this indispensable grace, therefore let him live like the rest of the world. And of course, he is speaking tongue in cheek. And he will spend the whole rest of the book establishing why that point of view, that because we are saved by grace and not works, means that works are not important that because we are saved by grace and not works, it would actually be better if we went on in the same old way so that we could experience God's grace in a more vibrant way. He asked the question, what difference does it make? And he answers it saying, it makes a great deal of difference. This is not the life to which God has called us in Christ Jesus. And hopefully we picked up on this a bit last week because before James wrote that magnificent statement, mercy triumphs over judgment, which was where our text ended, he had written, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Which feels a little enigmatic maybe to us as Christians who become accustomed to thinking of the grace of God in terms of just God's willingness to overlook however we choose to live and kind of pat us on the head and say that it will be okay. But this is parallel to Jesus' statement in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, where Jesus said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, and remember this was in the context of the Lord's Prayer where we were being taught to ask God to forgive us, as we forgive others, Jesus went on to add the commentary, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you have experienced the grace of God at that level where you turn and you look at those who have offended you and say, the same grace that covers my sin covers your sin, then in fact you have experienced the grace of God. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. And it's not a matter of cause and effect, as if somehow my lack of forgiveness drives God to refuse to show grace. It's a matter of cause and effect in that God's grace in my life, God's grace in your life, if you are a follower of Jesus, becomes the cause that affects our forgiveness and showing of grace and mercy to others. And it's against that backdrop that James goes on in verse 14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? See, mercy triumphs over judgment. It truly does. 
And James understood that we receive God's mercy. We are saved from our sin and we are saved from the eternal consequences of our sin by faith alone. It's abundantly evident in the question at the end of verse 14. If someone says that he has faith and does not have works, can that faith, literally, can the faith... The faith that he professes would be the way that the grammar is structured there. Can the faith, that faith that does not have works, save him? So I want to be clear here. The question is not, can we be saved by works? Whether we're talking about good works as we define those culturally and in society today, or good works even as defined by the law of God. We cannot be saved by works. James was an apostle and a brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was never in view in this book in any way. It was not even on his radar. But what he's saying is that there is a sort of faith that can be professed. It can be expressed in words, but not lived. So James wrote, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says He has faith but does not have works. In our day, in our culture, he might have written, what good is it, my brothers, if someone self-identifies as a Christian but does not live as a Christian? What good is it, my brothers, if someone self-identifies as a Christian, a Jesus follower, but then doesn't actually follow Jesus? I remember a very long time ago hearing, or maybe I read it on a t-shirt or some other unlikely source, the question, if you were placed on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And that's kind of the direction that James was going here. And having asked the question, James went on to answer it because the three verses that follow are a description, not of the kind of works that might save. We've already noted there are no works that can save. That option is not even on the table, but of what faith without works would look like. Beginning in verse 15, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now this isn't another example of synecdoche, which we've been talking about since we started the book of James, where James takes a part of something and lets it stand for the whole. He's not just singling this out, this idea of providing food and shelter and so forth for the poor and the needy, as if that becomes the sum and substance of what it means to be a Christian and someone who follows Jesus. He's establishing what we might call a kind of principle of work worthlessness. Um, The question of verse 14 could be rewritten. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, understanding that faith by itself is dead, can dead faith save someone? Can a faith that doesn't actually take root in our heart and change the way that we live actually save us? Is that even really faith? I do think James is being a little clever here in the way that he strings this all together. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he wrote about becoming judges with evil thoughts, judges with evil intentions or reasonings. If we look at the outward appearance of someone, if we look at someone who is poorly or shabbily clothed, and we condescend to them and say, here, you just sit here on the floor at my feet because you're not nearly as important as someone who might come into the assembly wearing fine clothes and obviously a prosperous person. Now, given that from the beginning, Christian worship has always included some form of benediction or blessing as a part of the service, you can sort of imagine that poor, shabbily clothed person sitting on the floor near the back and hearing at the end of the service the benediction, the Lord bless you. And keep you, the Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
And then the person who said, here, just sit here at my feet, says, um, yeah, you're going to have to move now. We've, we've got to get up and, and leave. So there's this blessing that's not connected to real life. And James is saying that a living faith, far from putting that brother on the floor, would have truly blessed him by inviting him to stay for a feast. But mostly what he's saying is that apart from consideration for a rumbling stomach, a professed faith that does not have works is dead, and dead faith is worthless. How worthless? Well, James pointed out in verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. I don't know if you've thought about it. I know I've said it before in, in services and in catechism classes and other places. But, you know, if we could have the devil himself stand up here on a Sunday morning, and we do not want that, but if he did, he could say the Apostles' Creed with the same sort of intellectual honesty that a lot of so-called Christians bring to that. Does Satan believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? Well, he doesn't trust in him, but he does believe in his existence. And for the vast majority of people in the world today, if they say, well, I do believe in God, that's what they mean. I believe in his existence. Does Satan believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son? Well, yeah. He was there in the wilderness for the 40 days and tempting him in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was an integral part of that whole story. He knows that there was such a person as Jesus Christ. And beyond what a lot of people in the world today might think, he knows that Jesus Christ was truly God the Son. Does he believe in the Holy Spirit? Well, yeah. He's fighting the Holy Spirit every single day. Does he believe in the existence of the holy Christian church? Of course he does. Again, the community of God's people, the body of Christ, is his primary enemy. So the demons believe, James says, in that way of being able to intellectually assent to a body of doctrine But can that kind of faith save? Honest to goodness, they believe in such a way that they tremble because they know what's coming. And a lot of people in the world today who say, well, I do believe in God, don't have the good sense to tremble before what they ought to know is coming if there truly is a creator God who has called us to salvation through faith in Christ and they have turned aside from that. The demons have, and I don't really want to use these words, but they at least have the good sense to tremble. But that kind of faith, this demonic faith, cannot save. It was demonstrated for us in the preceding verse, for someone will say, you have faith and I have works. The idea here is that Someone is saying, well, James, that's fine. You claim salvation by faith. I will claim salvation on the basis of works. And then James says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Which, by the way, is the answer to that question posed earlier from the Heidelberg Catechism. Question and answer 86. Since then, we are delivered from our misery merely of grace through Christ without any merit of ours. Why must we still do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image. In other words, just as he saved us by his grace through the work of his Holy Spirit, creating faith and repentance within us, Jesus Christ is also renewing us by that same Spirit, by that same grace. And he is transforming us into his image. As with our salvation, which is first, last, and always the work of God, our sanctification, too, is the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. And he does all of this. He saves us and he sanctifies us so that we may testify by the whole of our conduct, 
by the way that we live our lives in this world, our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us. Also that everyone may be assured of his faith by the fruits thereof, and that by our godly conversation, others may be gained to Christ. So three things there. We are saved, and then we do good works so that we may proclaim our gratitude to God and that he may be praised by us. It's not that we do them to merit anything towards our salvation. We could never do that. And it's not even that we do them because we are seeking some kind of reward. They will be rewarded. But mostly we do good works so that we will proclaim our praise for God in the grateful ways that we live our lives. Next, we do good works to be assured of our salvation as we see the fruit of the Spirit at work in our lives. How do we know if our faith is a living faith or a dead faith? We know by the effect that we see it having on us. If we profess to have faith, if we say... I have faith, I believe in Jesus Christ, but then we hear the word of Christ telling us to do something. I don't, I don't know, like at the beginning of James, where he said, here's the reaction that you were supposed to have to trials. Count it all joy when you meet trials, when you fall into, literally, trials of various kinds. Well, that's a command from the Lord through his apostle. How do I know if my faith is a living faith? Well, if it's a living faith, then when I hear that command, I ought to either implement it and be a doer of the word, or I ought to recognize, you know, I really struggle with that. I encounter trials, and I just want to push them off. I want nothing to do with them. But if we are followers of Jesus, then we do good works so that we can look at how the Spirit is at work within us and understand that we have truly been saved by grace through faith. And finally, we do good works so that by our conduct, others may be brought to faith. Jesus addressed this in the Sermon on the Mount when he was talking about doing good works. And he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and be overflowing with thankfulness for all the wonderful things you've done. No. Let your light so shine. Let your light shine before men in this way that they may see your good works. You're the one doing them, but they may give the glory to your Father who is in heaven. We do good works so that others may be pointed to Christ and to God through our godly conduct. Now the thing is, all three of those points rest on a single foundation. We do good works because Christ, having redeemed us and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image. We do good works because God is at work within us. As Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So on the one hand, our works can add nothing to our salvation because really our works are nothing if they are not actually God at work within us. Anything else really doesn't amount to good work. But if God has saved us by his grace and his spirit is moving us to hear and obey and engage with his word, then God is at work within us. We don't get credit for that. God gets the credit. God gets the glory. And on the other hand, this is why we need to ask ourselves some hard questions if we don't see the fruit of faith working itself out in our lives. If that description that Bonhoeffer included in the cost of discipleship sounds reasonable to us, well, why would we even try to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, as Paul said it in Titus? Why would we try? Because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to us, and God's grace doesn't just bring salvation 
God's grace transforms our lives into the image of Jesus Christ. I don't remember the source. Um, I, these are not my words, but somebody said a long time ago, if the grace that saved you didn't change you, then it probably didn't save you either. If you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, which incidentally is the only way of salvation, there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, then you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's that passage. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Great. But never quote 8 and 9 without 10. For we are his workmanship, and we were created in Christ Jesus for a purpose. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, which God before ordained. Would not be a bad translation there that we should walk in them. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now James throws out the examples of Abraham and Rahab as proof. By faith. In other words, through in and because of faith, when these old covenant saints, Abraham and Rahab, were called by God to act, they simply obeyed because that's what saving faith is and that's what saving faith does. Saving faith doesn't look to Jesus on the cross and say, well, I want all your benefits. I want to be absolutely sure that I am not going to face eternal judgment when I die, but don't try to tell me how to live my life. That is my business. Saving faith looks to Jesus Christ for redemption and then listens to Jesus Christ when he says, Now, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The call to discipleship throughout the Gospels is almost never believe in me, believe that I exist. It's never that. The call to discipleship throughout the Gospels is when Jesus meets people where they are in their sin and in their brokenness and says, now, come, follow me. Let me save you not only from the eternal consequences of your sin, let me save you from the consequences of that sin that you will experience from day to day. True faith, saving faith, the kind of faith that Hebrews 11 says pleases God, is created in us as a gift of God's grace so that we can walk in good the works that he prepared beforehand for us to do. True faith, Saving faith, the kind of faith that pleases God, then hears the call of God and responds to the call of God in an obedience that is born of trust. God surely must be governing my life because he loves me and he wants what's best for me. And therefore, even if I fall into trials of various kinds, I will count it all joy because I know that God is at work. True faith, saving faith, the kind of faith that pleases God can and should be professed. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. True faith must be professed. There must be an outward acknowledgement, public acknowledgement, of what Christ has done and who Christ is. Our catechism is not wrong when it tells us that, but true saving faith can never be contained in a creed where I can just walk around in this world and live like everyone else in the world and say, yeah, but in my heart, buried down deep where no one can see it, I really am a believer in Jesus Christ. True faith can never be merely a profession. So the question is asked and answered, what good is it, my brothers 
If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? Really, this whole text is James building up to his answer, absolutely not. It cannot save him, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead, and you cannot be saved by a dead faith. So, faith alone. Are we saved by faith alone? Yes, absolutely. Now and always, world without end. We are saved by faith and not by works. But someone has pointed out we are saved by faith that works. And not just works in its effect, bringing us to eternal life, but works in us according to God's will and God's purpose and makes us the people that he has called us to be. We are saved by the kind of faith that comes as a gift of God, which enables us time and again to hear God's word, to hear God's call and to respond to his call in the obedience born of trust. Once again, in the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, happy are the simple followers of Jesus Christ who have been overcome by his grace and are able to sing the praises of the all-sufficient grace of Christ with humbleness of heart. Happy are they who know that discipleship simply means the life that springs from grace and that grace simply means discipleship. Happy are they who have become Christians in this sense of the word. For them, the word of grace has proved a fount of mercy. May God give us ears to hear. May he work in us by his spirit and grace. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again we ask, give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us, your church, the body of Christ this morning. And Lord, may we not be hearers only who deceive ourselves, but doers of that holy word through your grace and through the power of your Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.